Uh, I'm a professor here at SIVA. I've been here since 2005. I'm currently the co-director of the Center for Environmental Economics and Policy with Doug Alman, and I'm also the co-director of Energy and Environment uh, at SIPA, which is like one of the concentrations for the master students. And uh, so today, I mean, this is the planned about that I'm going to speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then uh, we're going to open it up to your questions. And economic assessments of climate change is a very, very big topic, so I'm really just going to focus mainly on sort of two sub-aspects of it and sort of want to give you a flavor. But let me sort of uh, get started on this. First, uh, I want to welcome you to SIPA. You, you know, why would you, why is SIPA uh, interested in economic assessments of climate change? You know, and we have a mission statement that SIPA serves the global public interest by educating students to serve and to lead and producing and sharing new knowledge on the critical public policy challenges facing the global community. So if you think about critical public policy challenges, one thing I think I'm going to try to motivate in a second is that a lot of environmental problems are definitely one of the crucial public policy and challenges we face. I think there is really very broad consensus in the natural science community about climate change and the causes for it. The problem that we're currently having is, is basically to have effective public policies to address it. So CEPA is a great place to do that. We've been publishing articles here among the professors and advising uh, 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 many sort of uh, NGOs, uh, public officials and so forth. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of what we're doing, what I would teach in the class on this subject. So just to highlight, you know, you've seen the fires in California with a strong, uh, with a horrible air quality. You've seen it in like India, in, in China. We have really severe air uh, pollution challenges all around the world. And we're sort of thinking about potential ways and how to address them and how to regulate. Another thing is that people are often very interested in this sort of uh, a biodiversity loss. So this is a statistic from uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and this is also on the red list here from IUCN. And what you see here is that there is a large amount of species that are currently being uh, uh, deemed uh, threatened with extinction. So that's another thing we can focus on. But in this particular day, today I want to focus on climate change. And you might have seen it, NOAA just came out with the latest statistics that again, September 2020 was the warmest in record since we started in 1880. You see sort of here all across the world how we set sort of uh, new records that we've had. And so it's just becoming more and more evident that our climate is warming. I guess why I mentioned the other two topics though is and why we want to do economic uh, assessments of the cost is we have a lot of challenges and ideally we would like to address them all. But what economists always emphasize is that there's opportunity cost. So we should basically put our dollars to work where we feel the need is greatest. And so whenever we sort of address a public policy challenge, we need to ask ourselves how urgent it is, what we can do, and whether it would be better to spend it somewhere else. And there have been previous instances where people have been very worried about sort of environmental problems, like the limits to growth in the 1970s that didn't materialize. So it's very important to really take an analytical approach and try to be sort of, you know, science-based and evaluate what the outcomes would be. So just to highlight here, if you're interested in SIPA, we have many uh, faculty members that have been advising all kinds of governments and private institutions. This is just a small snippet of people here in the energy and environment concentration. Uh, but there's obviously many of the other concentration, we have many more. So our current vice dean, Scott Barrett, he was basically very uh, instrumental in malaria uh, eradication. Jeffrey Sachs is very famous for basically advising the UN. Joe Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate, he's been a chief economist at the World Bank. So I think the one thing that personally I like a lot about CIPA is sort of this overlap between academic research and also very like direct policy advice. Okay, so let me give you a bit of a motivation for economic damage assessments. I think there's a bit of a disconnect to start. So you, your generation might- I need to state as above all, an existential crisis. And as long as it's not being treated as a crisis, we can have as many of these climate change negotiations and talks, conferences as possible, it won't change anything. So that was Greta Thunberg. And you know, it's, there's a lot of movement, especially uh, I have some nephews, who are like currently high school students that go demonstrating with uh, Fridays for the Future. So we have sort of a really varied constituents that how they claim it is an existential threat. They see it as life-threatening, that with climate change, you know, we might, you know, there's potential really dire uh, consequences. So that's sort of some in the media. 
I also have a colleague here, a really famous one, Jim Hansen. He is a professor here at Columbia now. He used to be at NASA GIS. He's a very famous climate modeler. And he gave a TED talk, and I'm just going to give you a little snippet from him, too. What do I know that would cause me, a reticent Midwestern scientist, to get myself arrested in front of the White House protesting? This path is continued guarantees that we will pass tipping points, leading to ice sheet disintegration that will accelerate out of control of future generations. A large fraction of species will be committed to extinction. And increasing intensity of droughts and floods will severely impact breadbaskets of the world, causing massive famines and economic decline. Imagine a giant asteroid on a direct collision course with Earth. That is the equivalent of what we face now. Yet we shiver, taking no action to divert the asteroid. So, so again, he's a famous natural scientist and he sees this as a potentially very dire. He talked about tipping points. He talked about uh, the potential for food crises. And so there's again a call for very immediate and strong action. On the other hand, and this is sort of the contrast I want to start out with, there is a bit of a disconnect, at least with some of the initial uh, economic damage assessment. So it's very hard to sort of model, you know, in an economic context, uh, what the effect of climate change are. So we like to monetize things, so we basically get a better idea, as I said earlier, what the opportunity cost will be of where we should spend the money to sort of have the biggest payoff. And so what people have done is they started with those integrated assessment models. And so that's actually one thing uh, Bill Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize for. The idea of those models is basically the, the undertaking is very daunting. In a way, what you want to do is you want to calculate sort of the marginal effect on the margin of basically emitting another ton of CO2. And so what you basically have to do in those models is you think about, I emit an extra ton of CO2. I look what happens to temperatures over the next 100 years in all locations around the world. And then I translate those changes in temperatures into changes in you know, agricultural yields, mortality, and all outcome. And then I discount them back down to the present. And that basically gives me sort of the impact accumulated over the next century and, and what, it, uh, what would result from emitting an extra unit. So that's a, it's a, it's a very daunting modeling task. And credit to him for starting it. But the initial ones that were done, I think, made some very uh, strong assumptions. One is, for example, that the frank, uh, relationship between temperatures and the economy is, uh, is continuous. He specifically used it for drought. And what Jim Hansen already has sort of alluded to is, we nowadays see more and more evidence that it's not very smooth, that we can have disruptive incidences, and they're necessarily not well represented in those models. So that's something I come to in, in, in the next uh, uh, section. Um, so those models, the initial ones, have basically been extended. You might have heard about the big debate between the Stern Review. He used to be also chief economist at the World Bank. He's now in the UK, a professor who basically called for immediate action as being justified uh, because he used a much lower discount rate than what the uh, Nordhaus did. So as some theoretical reason, you will learn in the economics class why the discount rate might be lower. Again, there might be thresholds. Uh, there's some people like Derek Lemoyne and others who try to in include them. There are some uh, issues about risk management because we really don't know what the climate sensitivity is. So climate sensitivity basically means if I emit more CO2, how much will temperatures go up? But then uh, people from NASA GIS here at Columbia that I work with say that there's really sort of an upper bound on that because the amount of warming we observed over the last uh, 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 you know, uh, millions of years sort of suggests to us that it cannot be unbounded. Because if it's sort of, there are some economists who basically model this as having thick tails, and then you could say climate change legislation is like a risk management tool. So we have made a lot of advances, but still, if you look at the overall aggregate impact, it's not really that strong, especially if you sort of grow at 2% per year. The idea here is that, you know, if you have this very strong economic growth, the, the effects that we see is not something like Greta Thunberg would call like, you know, threatening to civilization. They are definitely measurable, they're sizable, and we should do something about it. But there still seems to be a bit of a disconnect between what some of the media fears will happen and what some of the initial climate damage assessment basically found. 
So the first thing I want to do then is sort of talk about one thing that we've done here is, which I think is very important about the level effects, and that's basically talking about nonlinearities. This idea is that we can have very strong uh, threshold effects that once we sort of hit the threshold, we basically have very strong negative effects on it. And so um, I'm going to give you this example for agriculture, but it applies for many other sectors as well. So before I go into agriculture, uh, a little bit of a motivation. Uh, agriculture is kind of a very interesting sector, even though we often don't get much attention of it in the media. Uh, it's actually been one of the sectors with the highest productivity growth in the entire United States. It's had this very distinct uh, two phases that before the Green Revolution and sort of mechanization in the, around 1945, it will have, we had yields that were roughly flat, meaning you got the same amount on average out every year. And then suddenly we have this strong increase. You will see this in a slide. So this is basically U.S. corn yields. And you see that again before sort of 1945, it was very, very flat. And then since then, we've had this remarkably increase. Now, this is basically the log, uh, the, log uh, the yields per bushels per acre. And you see this strong increase. You see this fluctuation around the trend. And that is basically caused by weather. And that's something I'll return to later, this very strong effect of especially extreme heat on yields. And then on the right axis in blue, you can also, also show this in logs. So you see that we had an almost exponential growth between 1940 and 1980. Exponential because it's linear in logs and it's sort of exponential in the level. And since then, it sort of started to fall off a bit. So some people have started to worry. Interestingly enough, since 1980, we've also started to see uh, increases in temperatures that are measurable. We have gotten a lot warmer since then. So one thing to note about agriculture that's sort of unique is that individual shocks tend to average out. This is one county in Virginia. It's basically the county with the smallest contouring area over the entire United States. 1,600 acres uh, is basically twice the size of Central Park. So it grows very little corn. So these are logs, so this basically means these are percent deviations. So you can see in a bad year, you can lose, easily lose 50% of the yield. That's a lot of uh, uh, loss to a farmer. However, that's just one county. And the thing is that weather is uncorrelated, at least on a global scale to a large extent. So once you start aggregating, so this for example is Virginia, you see that the shocks become much less. So we have now here maize yields, this is basically with the whole US that are much lower. If you look at the whole globe, again, it fluctuates less. And then if you bring in uh, two other big uh, caloric uh, uh, stables that are basically rice and wheat, you see that the fluctuation are at most 5%. So while individual farmers might face very large production shocks, one of the nice things about the global food supply system is that those shocks tend to average up. And nowadays, the fear is there's some researchers that with climate change and simultaneous uh, shift up in the temperature, that we actually get much more swings because we might make those shocks over bread faster, more uh, correlated. And the other thing that uh, 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 people sometimes don't notice is that there's basically those four basic commodities, soybeans, rice, wheat, and corn, that together account for more than 75% of the calories that we humans consume. So these are really the big four staples. That's directly what you eat and indirectly because they're used as a feedstock for a lot of meat producers, for livestock. So what we did here is we basically just converted the calories into the total of calories that are being produced and we divided by 2000 calories by 365 days. And it would tell you how much you could basically uh, feed people uh, if they were just eating those raw commodities. Obviously you don't wanna do that. It is uh, uh, a very unhealthy diet if all what you do is eat corn. But the idea here is just to sort of show you how much raw uh, uh, calorie output we have and you see that you can easily just with those four commodities can feed more than 7 billion people. Um, now, interestingly, you see how those lines here are very smooth, for example, for rice. Again, it's because those weather shocks average out. And you realize that the one that has the most zigzagginess is basically only for corn. There's a reason for that. And that is basically that the United States produces 40% of the world's corn. So the United States has a very large share in the color production. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, the U.S. share in food production is much, much higher than Saudi Arabia's share in oil production. And we always think about how important Saudi Arabia is for oil. Uh, 
So this is basically plotting the U.S. share in basic commodities. It's 40% for, 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 for maize. For, for rice, it's much lower, but of all the four commodities combined, it's roughly about 25%. So anything that happens in GS in terms of weather shocks has really large effect for food prices around the world. So this is then showing your food prices. There's things you can see is that food prices have been pretty stable again until around 1940. In 1940 is when the sort of the upward tick in yield started to take off. And that's when basically food prices started to decrease because production increases outpaced consumption increases. And then lately, you have, might have heard about this, we sort of seen an increase in food prices, and they have gone up, they tripled, but they are still low by historic standard in real inflation adjusted dollars. So we still, it's still cheaper to basically make the basic dietary, meet the basic dietary needs today than it was like inflation adjusted 100 years ago. Okay, so let me then talk about the effect of climate change on US yields. And so the important thing here to notice, this was a study uh, we did is that you basically, uh, uh, we looked at the uh, uh, exposure uh, to temperatures for US corn, uh, again, which is more than 40% of the world's production. So what you see here in blue is basically the distribution of exposure that we got. And the important thing is that we took account of how much each day you spend at each temperature ranging from the minimum on the day to the maximum on a really fine scale for the entire United States. So this is in Celsius for those who prefer Fahrenheit, you know, like uh, 30 degrees Celsius is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And then uh, zero freezing is 32 and, you know, 20 is 68. So obviously if you're above 30, it's above 86 Fahrenheit, you basically are in pretty warm temperatures. And you see there's quite a bit of probability mass. So you have some cold temperatures, you have some warm one, ideally you wanna be moderate. So if you then estimate a statistical model that sort of links this, uh, basically what we found is that sort of, you know, there's not much going on in plant growth below 10 degrees Celsius. So uh, that's basically 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, then we have a sort of almost linear increase in temperatures uh, and their effect on yields as we go up to about 29 degrees Celsius, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. And above that threshold, there's just a very steep drop off. Now, if you believe this graph, what this graph basically tells you at 24 hour exposure to a temperature and its effect on annual yields. So if you shift 24 hours from 10 degrees Celsius to 29 degrees Celsius, you would get about a boost of about 0.7% uh, in yields. Uh, um, 0.07%, sorry. On the other hand, if you go from 29 to 40, you would see that you get an almost 7% decrease uh, in yields. Now, obviously we're counting only partial days and you hardly ever 40 degrees Celsius for the entire day, but this is just a very, very strong effect on the yields. And so we basically found that this is the single best predictor of what happens to year to year fluctuation in corn yields. If you just count temperatures above 29 degrees Celsius for how long uh, and for, by how much, that explains more than half in the year-to-year -year fluctuation uh, 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 of corn yields. So it's this non-linearity that sort of Jim Hansen basically alluded to is that it seems, you know, people have before have done quadratics to so get a little bit of a damage, but really we're sort of falling off a cliff if you get to those maximums. And it's hard to specify this correctly, uh, but you need to do it to sort of simulate what would happen to food prices in the future. And I'm just leaving it here. If people have questions on this, this idea that extreme temperatures is very important. It's been something that's been confirmed in many other settings too. There's a study that used wheat trials in Kansas. You can look at rice yields in Asia, looking at the effect of minimum and maximum temperatures, but then minimum temperatures actually really matter. And it's always coming back to the really strong signals on maximum temperature, much stronger than on precipitation. Uh, the reason for the precipitation effect versus temperature is that it doesn't really get that hot until your soil is pretty dry, otherwise the evaporation cools it. So basically this hot temperature also means that it's usually very dry. And there's famous statistics, you know, in a way, drought is like a condition that depends on how much water the plant needs and how much it has. 
So temperature actually impacts the flies. Temperature basically increases the water demand by the plant and it decreases the water availability because of evaporation. That's why it's basically so important this, this hot temperatures. And so basically this cliff down, then we get like the decreases, we can get sizable effects. The effect of extreme temperature has also been confirmed in very, very different settings. Just mentioning a few here. People looked at labor supply and people basically, you know, you can look at uh, calls, uh, the workers in call centers, they slow down if it gets too hot. There's even a study now looking at test scores in New York City. If kids have to take the regents exam on a hot day, there's a much higher failure rate than on the next day when it was cold. So, you know, even in very well developed places like New York City, there's still a very strong effect of extreme heat on people's performance. There's a lot of evidence I'll show you in the next graph too, that uh, temperature extremes have a very strong effect on mortality as well. It obviously has an effect on energy consumption because once it gets very hot, you basically turn on uh, the air conditioner. There's a law of thermodynamics. It's much harder to cool than it is to heat. So the increase in energy consumption from extreme heat is actually higher than the energy you need for heating when it's cold. So it's true that if it gets warmer, that we need less heat in the winter, but we need more cooling in the summer. And given the laws of thermodynamics, unfortunately, that's going to make us use more energy because the cooling requires more additional energy than what we save for less uh, heating in the winter. There's also studies looking at the amenity value. People like a moderate to sort of moderately warm climate. If it gets too hot, that sort of means that people aren't happy on that either. And again, there's a highly asymmetric relationship that people dislike heat much more than they dislike uh, uh, cold. So this is one example I've shown you for mortality. Again, you sort of see the steep increase in, uh, in when it, it gets too hot. And uh, this is from an epidemiology journal. You know, for some of them, it's fairly flat down here, but then it sort of takes off pretty steep if it gets hot. There might be some adjustment, some uh, adaptation, which you see here is that in southern cities, which tend to be hotter, the effect of extreme heat tends to be lower, and that's because they basically adopted air conditioning. And I think, again, sort of circling back to the beginning, this is why economic damage assessments are very important, because sometimes engineers just extrapolate out, saying like, look, this is the north, this is how we currently observe the relationship in Boston. But the important thing is if it were to get permanently hotter, maybe more people install air conditioning and we could potentially flatten the curve. So we need to talk about economic incentives, people's adjustments to try to mitigate it, to sort of get a full picture of the effects that might arise of climate change. And so now how do you simulate the effects of climate change? So I'm doing a very simple scenario that's not realistic, but assume we have three degrees Celsius warming. If you have three degrees Celsius warming, you basically shift this distribution here up by three degrees Celsius. Then you take the difference between the old, the blue, and the new, the green, and that's basically the difference. And this is basically shows you why there might be very severe effects. There's some benefit from shifting colder temperatures to moderate temperatures. That gives you a bit of a yield boost, but then you get all this excess extreme heat here that gives you very, very severe reductions in yields. And that could lead to very dramatic uh, yield reduction. So we got a bit of a sort of a, a, a snippet into what might happen here in the US in 2012. It was exceptionally warm that year and yields dropped by 25%. And it's because we had a much higher uh, exposure to this uh, extreme heat. The model predictions actually ride on for 2012, that we have this very substantial. And again, given how much the US market share is, a 25% reduction is just huge for world markets and prices really spike. Unfortunately, with climate change, this will be the new normal. It's predicted to happen more and more. So we have some real issues about uh, feeding the world. So that was like the first topic I wanted to emphasize on, which was the nonlinearity. The second thing I wanted to quickly talk about is sort of the overall effects on GDP. And there basically a new kind of uh, uh, literature has emerged that basically emphasizes that the effect doesn't just occur in levels, but it basically occurs on the growth rate. So let me tell you what the difference is between a level effect and a growth rate effect. A level effect basically means in a particular year, you have a shock like on agriculture, you drop lower, that's what happened to yields, but then you recover to your trend and you basically return in the next year. 
So you get sizable impacts, but they're temporary. They're temporary because they occur in one year, and then you return to your previous trend on the black line. If you have a growth effect, what happens is you have some event happening, it knocks you down. That's what often happens with GDP, like with recessions. And then in your lower trajectory, and then you grow again. But you know what you see is you're basically on a newer trajectory, which is at a lower level than the previous trajectory. Now, obviously, a growth effect is much worse than a level effect, because each time you get knocked down, you get knocked down to a new lower level, and you get knocked down again. So it basically accumulates over, the, uh, over each period. So initially, uh, a lot of the economic damage assessment focused on level effects. Yes, there are sort of temporary impacts of temperatures, but then we sort of revert to the baseline. There's a new study that we might have seen in the news that they basically been a lot of press on the outcomes, on the findings. And what they basically have done is they've done empirical tests, and it seems to be that the growth effects in a global sense seem to actually be more accurate. The idea is that when we have a bad weather outcome, you get knocked down, and then you get to a permanently lower uh, trajectory for the future. So this is the study, but it basically did it. It lo looked at GDP growth all across the world, for all different countries, and then linked it to temperatures that the, the country experienced over the year. So what you see here is the distribution of global GDP. Uh, sorry, the GDP here is, the, is the, the, the bottom one. And you already see something pretty remarkable, that most of the GDP is actually the, uh, is, uh, is in pretty uh, moderate climates. In, on the other hand, that's not perfectly correlated with population. We have a lot of uh, uh, warmer countries that have lower GDP. And then here we have basically the observations of temperatures that we get. So there's this sort of disconnect between where population centers are and where a lot of the GDP is basically uh, generated. So it seems to be ideal in terms of like uh, uh, for, for an economy to basically uh, foster is if you have moderate temperatures. Uh, because it's sort of, again, human cognition is highest then, you have bad and bad, bad agricultural yields, uh, productivity of workers goes up, and so forth. So what this model in basically does is it estimates this common uh, for, uh, uh, effect. And I need to, if you, if you were to come here and take all the quant classes, you basically learn all about the interstices. The important thing they do here is in the studies, they don't compare apples to oranges. They don't compare like the US to Nigeria. What they do is they look at a country and then they look in that country what happens to GDP growth if the temperatures is warmer than normal, whether it, when it's colder than normal. So they basically look at a country and compare it to itself. So you don't compare apples and oranges. And what you see here in the United States is that lower than normal or hotter than normal is not a really a significant a strong relationship. On the other hand, if you go to warm countries like Vietnam or Mali, you see, if it's in that country, warmer than normal, the GDP is lower than normal. On the other hand, in Vietnam, also, if it's hotter than normal, GDP is lower than normal. On the other hand, if you go to the other side, like Iceland, which is one of the colder ones, you basically see that if they have a warmer temperature than normal, the GDP growth is higher than normal. So that's why you get sort of this over envelope. It's not by comparing the different countries. It's basically comparing countries to itself over time and checking whether uh, temperature deviation that was hotter or normal, uh, colder than normal, gave you a higher or lower GDP growth than, uh, than usual. So if you look at this, there's sort of this remarkably consistent result. Here, the data is split into richer countries and poorer. You find very similar sort of uh, functional forms here with an optimal temperature, again, around in, in, in moderate temperatures. You can look at technological progress. The blue line is the early part, 1960 to 89. The red line is the later part. Again, they give very similar uh, results. And so what they then do is uh, they basically simulate what would happen to GDP growth. Um, just to, if you're not familiar with climate change scenario that are in the IPCC world, SSP 5 is basically one that has high baseline growth and fast income conversions. So basically when you do those climate simulations, you always have to do them on top of a baseline scenario that you basically assume. So SSP5 means GDP is growing fairly rapidly and developing countries are catching up to developed countries. On the other hand, SSP3 has lower baseline growth and also uh, slower income uh, conversions. So that's what you see here. Basically, each line is a country. 
Uh, so if you lower here, it means you start with a lower GDP. These are the high GDP countries. You see that SSP5 is given on the left, SSP3 is given on the right. You see the faster income growth on the left than in the right because the, the lines are drifting up quicker on the left than on the right. You see a larger convergence on the left because by the end of the century, the distribution of GDP between countries is sort of closer together than here where we have sort of larger discrepancies between countries. That's just the baseline scenario. But sort of the important thing is what they now did is using the functional form they've estimated, they're going to simulate the same path over the next, uh, over the century until 2100. But this time they changed the temperatures according to climate forecasts. And what you basically see is this remarkable effect that in some countries, GDP doesn't grow anymore. It actually starts to decrease. And you can see here some poor countries, which tend to be hot to begin with, you might actually get not just a drop in the growth compared to what you would have otherwise had, you might actually get an absolute decline in GDP. Now there are some cold countries like Iceland, which actually grow more than they would have done without climate change. However, that's not a lot of the mass here. So there's pretty sizable overall GDP impacts. But whenever we talk about overall GDP impacts and overall climate impacts, we always have to be very careful because there's huge regional discrepancies. There might be some cold countries that actually benefit. Some hot countries are really, really severely strained already and they might have a very hard time. And then sort of in the middle, they sort of see declines as well. But on the aggregate, there would be a sizable reduction. So to conclude, I'm here like the 35 minutes now and I'm very happy to take your questions then. Uh, I think, you know, they're historically, the, uh, the integrated assessment models, they gave some uh, climate damages, but they weren't necessarily as large as some other people have uh, feared. I think there's been two innovations lately. The first one is this highly asymmetric relationship and the nonlinearity, which suggests that us shifting more temperatures to extreme heat might have actually quite large effects. That, uh, uh, that, that monetary buys are very large and we should really do something to avoid them. And the second thing is that in the initial assessments, we usually assume that those shocks lead to temporary reductions, but there's more and more evidence that it seems to actually impact the growth rate, which is basically a permanent reduction setting you in a lower trajectory. And therefore it sort of accumulates over time, leading to uh, potentially very severe uh, GDP effects by the end of the century that would really justify policy intervention now, even on a benefit cost analysis basis.